This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh as we broadcast from Cairo, Egypt. This week, Vice President Kamala Harris wrapped up a two-day visit to the Philippines that included a meeting with President Ferdinand Marcos, Jr. In a speech aboard a Philippine Coast Guard patrol ship docked at the edge of disputed waters of the South China Sea, uh, Harris said the U.S. would defend the Philippines in the face of intimidation and coercion from China. Harris vowed to expand the U.S. military presence in the country even after former bases leaked toxic waste into the environment. Well, uh, last Friday, I had a chance to speak with uh, Yeb Sanyo. He is a well-known Filipino climate activist. We sat down together at the U.N. Climate Summit in Sharm el-Sheikh, uh, here in Egypt. Um, he used to be the chief negotiator for the Philippines climate delegation. But after he made an emotional plea in 2013 at the climate summit in Warsaw, Poland, after Typhoon Haiyan devastated the Philippines, well, we'll talk about what happened next. This is what he said. What my country is going through as a result of this extreme climate event is madness. The climate crisis is madness. Mr. President, we can stop this madness right here in Warsaw. So that was 2013. The next year, as another deadly storm battered the Philippines, Sanya was unexpectedly absent from the UN Climate Summit in Lima, Peru. He'd been pulled from the delegation at the last minute. Since then, Sanyo has returned to COP every year as an activist. Now Yeb Sanyo is executive director of Greenpeace Southeast Asia. I spoke to him Friday in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, about the assessment of the summit this year, what had been accomplished and what hasn't. Yes, we came to Sharm el-Sheikh to demand action. Um, for uh, the interests of those most impacted by the climate crisis. And uh, we hope to bring justice and accountability into the heart of these talks by way of establishing a fund, a fund for loss and damage. And when we talk about loss and damage, it is because we live in an era where we have realized the limits to being able to adapt to climate change. What, what's happening to, to the negotiations? Well, what do you mean exactly by loss and damage? So when we talk about climate change, there, there is a notion of being able to adapt, to adjust, so that you don't get impacted so severely. But when you talk about not being able to do that, meaning you lose lives, you lose cultures, you lose non-economic and economic losses and damage, that is inflicted on so many communities. We're talking about a, an entirely different proposition here now. Uh, uh, communities can, uh, can no longer adapt, can, they can, can no longer adjust, or they have no means to be able to access resources that will allow them to do so, and then they, 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 they lose, you know, basically losing homes, losing land, losing livelihoods. Uh, and even losing entire cultures, some islands are even disappearing. And, and especially when we talk about slow onset events like sea level rise, there is no recourse for the most impacted. That's why we now talk about loss and damage, and that was established as the third pillar under the Paris Agreement. You've said that rich countries are rich for a reason, and that reason is injustice. Explain. Well, absolutely. The, the kind of uh, comfort uh, and the kind of uh, progress, uh, you, you, you can say, that is now being enjoyed in the global north is a product of, you know, decades, maybe centuries of subjugation of the global south, including, of course, slavery, including racial injustice, including uh, plundering resources in the global south. And so that was a product of all of that. And now, of course, including uh, the use of atmospheric space by way of burning fossil fuels. And then the Global South countries, which have, uh, have the least contribution to this problem, are those who are suffering the most. It is, it's really a simple story. It's very unfair, and that is unjust. So you were already, as a negotiator in Warsaw, talking about loss and damage. Um, here you're talking about putting money into that mechanism, and that's what the whole debate is about. You had John Kerry 
weeks ago uh, in an event with the New York Times uh, saying loss and damage means liability and compensation, and that's a place we can't go. He might have modified that over the last few weeks because of enormous pressure. But if you can talk about specifically the U.S. It's a country you have called out as the largest historic emitter of greenhouse gases. What role are they playing at the COP27? What we're seeing uh, at COP27, in, in particular on the outcome on establishing this fund, is that the U.S. is favoring the non-establishment of it, that we just continue talking and spend more resources to uh, organize more dialogues and organize more meetings so that we don't get to establish a fund. That is very blatant in the face of real loss and damage affecting many people and communities. And uh, I, I still struggle to understand the, the U.S. position on this one, when we acknowledge, of course, the importance of uh, responsibility especially historical responsibility. That's why we have climate change. Um, we're not even talking about compensation and liability here. Maybe there's something they, they imagine that could be a result of this entire conversation that they're really afraid of. Uh, but, of course, at the heart of it is, in fact, being, a, being held liable and accountable for uh, all of the harms uh, uh, inflicted on people as a result of climate change impacts. Um, th this, is, this is really basic. Uh, human fairness, right? So it's it's those countries in the global north that have created much of this problem uh, should be leading the way towards uh, demonstrating the human solidarity. I think just establishing this fund is, a, is, is, a, is an expression of human solidarity for those who did not cause this problem but bear the brunt of its impacts. Mm. So. If you can give advice to activists, you were the chief climate negotiator for the Philippines in 2012, then in 2013 in Warsaw. 2014, you're abruptly, well, just, you don't show up. I remember when we were in Lima, uh, because of your powerful speeches the year before, we were looking forward to talking to you, but you just weren't there. Explain why you were pulled from the delegation. 2015, you're a major activist in Paris. You go on a hunger fast for climate justice. Talk about your transformation. And since you were a negotiator, a chief negotiator, what you think the different, what kind of impact organizers can have? Oh, when I left this job, uh, I decided I think the institutions we have built will never be enough for us to truly make a difference. And I decided to join the people's movement uh, to fight climate change. Why were you tossed in 2014? Well, in 2014, to be perfectly honest, I have never bothered to, to, to find out why, but I, have, I suspect it is because of my vocal critic of the West. The Philippines actually often taking a line that is critical of the West, um, even the government, but in the end you say that they're actually working together? I, 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 I don't have any information on that, but I think uh, being pulled from the delegation for negotiators who are vocal against the responsibility of rich countries in this whole process, I think it happens to uh, smaller countries, to countries that have less power. It happens. There's, there are a lot of strings attached in these negotiations. So talk about, you're talking about the pressures you're under as a negotiator, but what filtered through to you, uh, which gives you a sense of how you can be most effective on the outside? Well, I've always, I've always cared about uh, making people understand that this is not just a scientific issue. This is, this is not just a technical issue, and it's not just an environmental issue. At the heart of the climate crisis is deeply rooted, uh, it's a deeply rooted broken system, that, and then the kind of economic world order that, uh, that dominates all of us is something that we must change, and system change must be at the center of, uh, of our struggle against climate change. And I, I think that could only be done at the grassroots. I, I don't think this battle will be won or lost in these plenary halls, nor in chambers of law. This will be won in the chambers of people's hearts, and therefore uh, that will have to be done by organizing people. There is no magic wand. There is no silver bullet to this. 
organizing means talking to people, organizing communities, and making people understand the root causes of the climate crisis. So can you talk about the dangers that environmental activists face? In 2021, the nonprofit group Global Witness um, said it had recorded that for the eighth straight year, the Philippines, Asia's deadliest country for land defenders, Last year, it recorded a total of 29 documented killings of people defending their homes, land, livelihoods, and ecosystems in the Philippines alone. This is a very sad reality for Filipino activists, and in particular, land defenders, most of them uh, coming from indigenous communities. We have seen uh, the impunity. We have witnessed the impunity. I, I know of uh, uh, friends who uh, have given up their life just to be able to speak out, speak truth to power and to defend their land. And it, it's, uh, it's shameful to, to live in a country such as uh, my country that uh, where, where environmental defenders are, are murdered, are not given the space uh, that is necessary to truly be able to uh, protect the environment and fight for social justice. It's, it's sad. It's sad. And, uh, it's, it's, it's something that uh, the world needs to pay attention to, and many people around the world should stand with people of the Philippines in solidarity. Uh, this week, the new president, uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., the son of the dictator, Ferdinand Marcos, uh, called Bambang Marcos, uh, is at APEC, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit in Thailand, where he's pushing other heads of state, he says, for climate change adaptation. Um, in September, uh, President Marcos called for climate action when he addressed the U.N. General Assembly. Let's watch. The effects of climate change are uneven and reflect an historical injustice. Those who are least responsible suffer the most. The Philippines, for example, is a net carbon sink. We absorb more carbon dioxide than we emit. And yet, we are the fourth most vulnerable country to the effects of climate change. This injustice must be corrected, and those who need to do more must act now. So that's the new president, Ferdinand Marcos, Bong Bong Marcos. If you can talk about your assessment of him on climate and also when it comes to threats against activists, we know how Duterte uh, was so devastating when it came to violence against activists. So Marcos Jr. has a uh, a legacy to carry with him, and that part of that legacy is the uh, is, is the inability and the lack of willingness to acknowledge historical responsibility for human rights violations committed by his father. And for me, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice anytime and anywhere, like what Martin Luther King Jr. said. And, and this failure to acknowledge that responsibility is 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 is, is blatant. And that would reflect on uh, him uh, in, as he is now in power as president. And I would think that uh, until he acknowledges that, uh, all of, all of the violation, human rights violations in the past, it would be very difficult for us to trust that he can deliver uh, justice in, in, in any form. And talking about his, uh, his, his climate change rhetoric, uh, we need to see that in action. The Philippines continues to um, uh, to, to, to be powered uh, mostly by coal power, and there is no indication that renewable energy, for example, will be a priority for, for this government. Uh, uh, there, there is still a lot of coal-fired power plants being built, and we need to see rhetoric translated into action, even if he's championing climate justice in the world. Uh, it, we would be, it would be very hard for us to, to believe that until we see real uh, real sincerity in the in the context of being able to espouse justice and in uh, the fighting for human rights for the Filipino people. Also, uh, Maria Ressa's Rappler uh, just ran a story headlined: "The Philippine delegation to COP27 faces leadership shakeup," and reported the 29-member delegation of the Philippine team finds itself without its original head of delegation as well as top officials of the Climate Change Commission. Do you know anything about what's happening there? 
Honestly, no. I, uh, I have not been following the, the, that particular issue. I do know that there are members of the Philippine delegation here, I see, uh, doing the all-nighters. So I think uh, some members of the delegation are doing their jobs really well. You know, climate change is tribute to a lot of things, most significantly fossil fuel and uh, greenhouse gas emissions. I understand you're a vegan now. Is that true? No, I, I am a vegetarian. You're a vegetarian. How does that uh, play into climate action? Why do you see that as a part of it? Well, this is, this is truly important because uh, when we when we live our values as activists, it's, it's really important for us to understand the big picture. And the part of that big picture is how uh, the meat industry affects climate change in so profound ways. And that's something that I care about, although that's a very personal choice for me. Mm. So can you talk finally about your life as what you called yourself a climate pilgrim? Talk about what the, that meant when you went from negotiator to activist, um, the many miles you spent walking to educate people about climate change. So uh, we've, we've embarked on these special journeys, um, some of them in conjunction with the uh, UNFCCC Conference of the Parties, uh, climate summits as we call it, uh, in 2015 from Rome to Paris and in 2018 from Italy to Poland, over six countries. These journeys uh, pay homage to people and communities affected by the climate crisis and part of the intention is to be able to have conversations in every town that we pass through uh, and carrying the stories from the most vulnerable communities in, in especially in my country. That's Yeb Sanyo, executive director of Greenpeace Southeast Asia. I spoke to him Friday at the UN Climate Summit in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt. And that concludes our broadcast from Egypt for the last two weeks. Special thanks to the whole AP crew here in Cairo Rania Khidr, Julian Jones, Ahmad Al Naqib, Ahmad Hikmat, Ahmad Ali, and Alice Loka. And special thanks to our Democracy Now! team here in Cairo Sharif Abdel Kadus, Nermin Sheikh, Hani Masood, and Dennis Moynihan. And in New York, Democracy Now! produced with Renee Feltz, Mike Burke, Dina Gesta, Messiah Rhodes, Maria Tarasena, Tammy Warren, Trina Nadura, Sam Alcock, Tay Maria Studio, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Mary Conlon. Special thanks to Julie Crosby. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. <laughs>